morning. So, in the previous class we started the discussion on the capital ratio or we can say that how the bank capital is important for the economic growth process and as well as the stability for the bank. And considering that importance, uh, we can argue that the bank capital should be regulated. Uh, what kind of capital adequacy ratio the bank should maintain that should be basically determined by the regulatory bodies. So, in this context uh, over the uh, period we have seen that various regulatory bodies have provided certain kind of guidelines, certain kind of uh, rules on which the particular capital ratio or capital adequacy ratio is always based upon. Uh, in today's class, we will be discussing about uh, that uh, regulatory capital ratio or regulatory capital adequacy ratio or regulatory capital requirements, what the banks should always hold. In this context, we can say that uh, it is particularly started with the Basel 1, which was uh, kind of regulatory norms was established by the BIS, Bank for International Settlement. And in this, in this context, they have tried to provide certain kind of uniform guidelines that how much capital ratio the bank should always maintain or the minimum capital adequacy ratio what the bank should maintain. So, in this context, uh, they have added the concept of capital adequacy ratio, which was uh, not that way used before whenever we are talking about the bank capital. If you, if you, if you see that previously we are talking about the capital ratio. The capital ratio is nothing but your total capital, which comprised of both debt and equity divided by the total assets. But according to the Basel norms, they are giving the importance with respect to the capital adequacy ratio and the capital adequacy ratio is basically what? It is instead of total assets, we are talking about the risk weighted assets. We basically always talk about the risk weighted assets. So, here the question is that there are two things, one is your numerator which is total capital and you have, uh, you have the denominator which is your risk weighted asset or in short we can call it RWA. So, then how the risk weights are given on the basis of what type of risk the weights should be given and what are those typical components of the capital, these are basically the questions always come or always we face whenever we discuss about the regulatory capital adequacy ratio, what the bank should always maintain. So, therefore, we will be discussing about what exactly the capital adequacy ratio is and how the capital adequacy or the calculation of capital is always made by the commercial banks as per the Basel norms. So, this is the discussion what we can start with this Basel 1, then we can move towards the Basel 2 and Basel 3 in the subsequent sessions. So, then uh, here if you talk about this, already we said that whenever the Basel norms were started or maybe we can say that the BI has uh, thought of having certain kind of uh, uniform guidelines for maintaining the capital. It is uh, started in 1988. Uh, here the basic objective of the Basel 1 was to encourage the banks to keep their capital positioning strong by that they can absorb the losses or the shocks at any point of time if they are going to face. And as well as it also reduce the inequalities in capital requirements between the different countries, a kind of uniform policy can be adopted across the countries. It will also help to promote the fair competition among the different banks. And as well as previously we are only considering about the unbalanced items, but as per the emergence of the Basel norm, the importance of the off balance sheet items also has increased. So, Basel, according to Basel norm, the off balance sheet items also should be considered whenever we are talking about the uh, assets and as well as the risk weighted assets. And according to this norm, the equity, common equity or the uh, owner's own 
uh, capital whatever they have invested in that particular company or particular bank, it is the most valuable type of capital what we can consider. And uh, according to Basel 1, the minimum capital requirement should be 8 percent. That means, the capital adequacy ratio should be 8 percent or more than that. So, these are kind of agreement or the basic objective behind this uh, Basel 1, which is basically always uh, trying to make certain kind of uniform policy across the countries and to maintain the stability of the commercial banks. Uh, here, then how the what kind of risk should be considered whenever the uh, risk weighted assets are calculated. So, the vessel has given the importance to credit risk, which is the most important risk what the commercial banks face, because the loan is their major business. So, there is always a probability of default of uh, payment or repayment of that particular loan. So, because of that they have started giving importance to the credit risk. So, greater the risk, the greater should be the capital. So, if the particular bank is exposed to more credit risk, then the capital requirements of that particular bank also should be more. So, in this case, they have divided the capital into two types. One is your tier 1 capital and tier 2 capital. That is why there are two tiers of capital is considered uh, by the uh, commercial be considered by the commercial banks. And Vessel also one uh, also required to always uh, determine the current market value for a contract that is similar to the contract they have actually made with a customer in order to figure out the latter's replacement cost. So, the replacement cost is uh, playing a role whenever we talk about mostly the off balance sheet items and the other items what the banks are holding. So, these are the considerations the basic uh, agreements of the vessel 1 it is mostly relied upon the capital adequacy ratio. So, we will see over this uh, particular discussion that how the capital adequacy ratio is measured and over the years what kind of changes have taken place with respect to the regulatory norms. So, in this case uh, if you see that uh, there are two types of capital vessel has considered one is tier 1 and tier 2. And there are various items which comes under tier 1 and various items which comes under tier 2. So, according to vessel 1, the total capital of the bank should be tier 1 capital plus tier 2 capital and minus some kind of investments and some kind of deductions, whatever the bank should always consider. So, already we said that the in the in the context of tier 1 capital, we have the common stock, we have the return earnings we have the non cumulative perpetual preference shares or preference stocks and the minority interest in the equity accounts of consolidated subsidiaries if a bank has any kind of subsidiary and the selected intangible assets which will be a minus the goodwill and the other intangible asset for the bank is holding. So, these are coming under the tier 1 category and whenever you come to tier 2 we have the allowances for the loans and leases what the bank has carried out, subordinated debt particularly the long term debt what the bank is holding and the mandatory convertible debt which is can be converted to equity after a certain period of time. Then intermediate term preferred, preferred debt because non cumulative stocks are part of tier 1, but the preferred stock which are uh, we can say that intermediate in nature they can be part of tier 2. Then cumulative uh, perpetual preferred stock with unpaid dividends if there is any equity notes. Then the other long term capital instruments which has either debt feature or the equity feature. So, these are so mostly if you summarize this thing we can say that the return earnings and the equity these are coming under uh, these are basically comes under the tier 1 capital and the debt components are mostly comes under the tier 2 capital. So, these are the basic differences between the tier 1 capital and the tier 2 capital of the commercial bank as per the vessel 1. So, therefore, 
uh, in final if you want to calculate the total regulatory capital that should be tier 1 capital plus tier 2 capital minus the investments uh, in unconsolidated subsidiaries minus the capital securities held by the bank that were issued by the other depository institutions in the system and they are also held under the, under the reciprocity agreement minus the activities persuaded by savings and loan association that may be, may have been acquired by the banking organization, but they are not permissible to for the national banks and minus is there if there is any other items. So, those items are basically negligible nature. So, mostly this uh, total capital includes the tier 1 capital and the tier 2 capital and tier 1 consists of equity, owner's equity and tier 2 capital basically consists of the debt. So, now uh, there are certain kind of guidelines what the vessel 1 has given already uh, uh, what we have seen according to Bessel that uh, first of all that the total capital divided by the risk weighted asset, the total capital divided by risk weighted asset must uh, should be at least 8 percent less uh, greater than or equal to 8 percent. And again they said out of this total the 50 percent capital should be equity that means the tier 1 capital divided by the risk weighted asset that should be 4 percent. If your complete one is 8 percent then that 4 percent should be the tier 1 capital that also they have to keep in the mind. And the tier 2 capital whatever the bank is holding that should not exceed the 100 percent of the tier 1 capital. That means, the debt component should not exceed the 100 percent of the equity component of the commercial bank. So, then uh, in general if you want to write it in a formula, then your capital adequacy ratio or the total risk based capital ratio what we can call them that is basically a total capital divided by the risk weighted asset that is the tier 1 capital plus tier 2 capital minus whatever reductions are required divided by the risk weighted on the balance sheet items and the risk weighted on off balance sheet items or off balance sheet assets. So, both on balance sheet and off balance sheet items should be considered whenever we are trying to calculate the risk weighted asset of that particular commercial bank uh, and the capital adequacy ratio will be measured accordingly. Then we can see that uh, basically uh, if you summarize it then total capital ratio capital adequacy ratio should be greater than or equal to 8 percent tier 1 capital to risk weighted asset should be greater than or equal to 4 percent and the bank should have the minimum leverage ratio that should be again greater than or equal to 4 percent and uh, the risk adjusted asset already whatever we have that would, that should be at least 4 percent. So, this is what the capital requirements uh, the vessel has defined. So, then how the risk basically because already we have discussed that the whatever risk weights will be given those weights will be given on the basis of the credit risk. So, credit risk is the major risk what the bank always faces and considering that importance the vessel also has given the importance towards the credit risk. So, then Bessel has basically defined those assets there are some asset there is a 0 percent risk that is why there is uh, we do not have to provide any weight for that. There are some assets that are 20 percent risk weight these are the standard process what the Bessel has recommended and the bank has to consider that particular standard uh, kind of rules where the Bessel has recommended to calculate the risk weighted asset as per the Bessel 1. And there are some assets which are 50 percent category and there are some assets they have the 100 percent risk weight. So, accordingly the total risk weighted assets can be calculated. So, if the credit risk is increasing your capital requirement also should increase because they have to maintain a particular level of ratio and to maintain that particular ratio if the risk is increasing the capital also has to increase to maintain that particular ratio in a particular level. 
So, the same thing also can be applied for the off balance sheet items, but only thing is there is a conversion factor where the off balance sheet items has to be converted into the on balance sheet items using certain kind of conversion factors. That also we have to we have to see that what kind of off balance sheet items, how they are converted into the on balance sheet items and accordingly the risk weights can be provided. So, if you see this table that uh, it is about the uh, on balance sheet items that whenever the uh, non balance sheet assets that whenever the weights are given to or risk weights are given to the different type of assets, then which are those assets which comes under the zero credit risk and there are some assets comes under the low credit risk, then moderate credit risk and the highest credit risk. So, for the zero credit risk we can say the cash deposit with the reserve bank whether it is federal reserve bank or any other reserve bank of uh, any other countries or central bank of any other countries, treasury bills, notes and bonds of all maturities, government national mortgage association, mortgage backed securities, debt securities issued by the government and world's leading industrial of the leading uh, world's leading industrial countries. Because the Basel 1 or Basel recommendations were given for only the developed countries, mostly the 12 countries were considered and all those countries are mostly the developed countries. Although any other country or most of the countries are following this vessel norm with some certain modifications, but the vessel was basically designed for the uh, banking operations of the developed countries. Under 20 percent bracket, we have uh, interbank deposits like money market deposits, general obligation bonds and note issued by the states backed by US government agencies or any other government agencies. Mortgage backed securities issued by or guaranteed by Federal National Mortgage Association or by the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation. There are various sources from where the particular money is coming or different uh, investment opportunities or alternatives are available. Accordingly, the weights are given to uh, that particular asset and these are coming under the 20 percent weight category because they have the low credit risk. In the 50 percent category, we have the residential mortgage loans what the commercial banks have given and the revenue bonds issued by the state and local government units or the agencies. And 100 percent category if you see, these are mostly the commercial and industrial loans what the bank has provided, the loans given against the credit card, the investments made on the property, real property basically uh, in bank subsidiary companies and all other assets not listed basically previously. So, apart from this whatever remaining assets are there that also comes under the highest credit risk category. So, because of that the 100 percent credit risk weight will be should be given to calculate the risk weighted asset. Then we have the off balance sheet items. In the off balance sheet items we have two things one is uh, uh, whenever the bank has gone for any kind of uh, commitments or any kind of guarantees or any kind of letter of credit, there are many ways the bank is holding the off balance sheet items. So, whenever these kind of off balance sheet items the bank hold, they are also exposed to certain amount of credit risk. In that context, what basically the banks do, there are they divide this contract risk into two categories. One is potential market risk exposure another one is the current market risk exposure expected and current. So, the risk exposure refers to the danger of loss at some future time if the customer who earned into a market based contract with the bank fails to perform. And whenever it is a current market ex risk exposure, it is basically designed to measure the risk of loss uh, should a customer default today on its contract which would compel the bank to replace the failed contract with a new one. So, there are certain kind of risk which can be expected in the future and there are certain risk which is already bank is exposed to that. So, the off balance sheet items has like two components of the credit uh, risk exposure and accordingly uh, the weight should be provided to that. So, if you see this table, we have seen that the loan commitments with less than one year to go. Uh, the standby credit letters 
uh, one year to go, these are basically zero credit risk of balance sheet items. And in the, stand, uh, the 20 percent category, we have the standby credit letters backing the issue of state and local governments general obligation of the bonds, these are comes under 20 percent category. Trade based commercial letters of credit that we have discussed before and the bankers acceptances, uh, these are comes under the 100 percent category and the conversion factor for them is uh, 0 0.2 and we have the standby credit letters guaranteeing customers uh, future performance and unused bank loan commitments longer than a year that basically the 100 percent risk category and we have given a conversion factor of 0.5 and the standby letter of credit issued to the bank repayment of the commercial paper that comes under the highest risk category we are giving a conversion factor of 1. So, this is the way the conversion factors are considered and accordingly they can be converted into the uh, unbalanced set items category and then the weights can be given to the different amount of money exposed to that particular kind of instruments. Then the bank also is holding some other balance sheet items like derivatives. So, according to Basel 1, if you see the Basel 1 basically adjusted to account for risk from derivatives like futures, options, swaps and all these things uh, to hedge against the changing currency prices, interest rates and the positioning of the commodities. So, the many of the derivatives uh, instruments are exposed a bank to counterparty risk also. The risk of many of these instruments limited because they are traded in the organized exchanges, but still there are some risk involved in that. And the credit conversion factor for interested derivatives are always set lower than the credit conversion fa factor of the contracts tied to the value of the foreign currencies. So, because of the nature of the derivatives contract, the conversion factor also change. So, in, the, in this case, if you see the conversion factors like this, the conversion factor for converting interest rate and the currency into equivalent amounts of on balance sheet items, if you see this one, we have uh, 0 conversion factor whenever we, the interest rate contracts 1 year or less to maturity. It is uh, 0.5 percent uh, if you talk about, then it is interest rate contracts over 1 year to maturity that means 0 0.005 and conversion factor of 1 percent, we are telling about the currency contracts 1 year or less to maturity and it is uh, 5 percent of the conversion if the currency contracts over 1 year to maturity. That means, the currency contracts are more riskier than the interest rate contracts what the banks are holding. So, this is the way the conversion factor can be considered to convert those particular assets uh, as a part of uh, the amount of non uh, unbalanced items what the banks are holding. So, now if you see that there are there is a process or there is a steps what we have to follow to calculate the risk weighted asset. So, first we have to compute the risk equivalent amount of each of balance sheet item, find the appropriate risk weight for each balance sheet of, uh, of, uh, of the of balance sheet items whatever the bank has and multiply each balance sheet and credit equivalent of, uh, of balance sheet items by the correct risk weight as per the guidelines. Then add all these things to find out the risk weighted assets. So, uh, in this context considering those conversion factor and the different balance sheet on balance sheet and off balance sheet items, if you see this example it will be more clear for you that if you see that let uh, there is a hypothetical bank whose uh, uh, capital is uh, 6000 and total asset value is 1 lakh. Then we have the cash 5000, treasury security is 20000, deposit balance 5000, loan secured by the uh, 1 to 4 family residential property is 5000, then your private corporation loan is 65000, then we have total 1 lakh here and we have two off balance sheet items here, your 10000 and 20000, total is 30000. Then we see that uh, using this conversion factor and uh, uh, all those kind of guidelines given by Vessel 1, we can see that how the risk weighted assets can be calculated and the capital adequacy ratio can be calculated. Your total capital ratio has become uh, 6 percent uh, in this case, uh, because we have only the total capital divided by the total assets that already we know. 
but now we have seen while calculating the risk weighted asset we have two balance sheet items for one we have a conversion factor one for others it is 5.5 then here it is 10000 into 1 it is 10000 20000 into 0 0.5 that is 10000 now we can come to the uh, final calculations so we have the on balance sheet items like cash treasury securities we don't have any risk with respect to that that's why we are putting zero here the zero value 20 percent risk quitting category that is you have 5000 and 10000 then we have value this uh, uh, 3000 here the 50 percent risk quitting category we have uh, 5000 only that is coming 2500 then the 100 percent category we have this is your on balance sheet this is your off balance sheet then we have 75000 then we have total is 80500 so your rwa has become 80500 and now if you want to see that uh, your final calculation that your total capital was uh, 6000 which was given uh, your total capital was uh, 5000 which was 6000 which was given and risk weighted asset is 80500 then your ratio has become 7.45% so, the 7.5 percent uh, if you whatever 7.45 we have calculated that is less than the minimum requirement that is 8 percent. That means, the particular bank is uh, maintaining a capital adequacy ratio which is below the regulatory limit or the minimum regulatory limit of 8 percent. That means, it is a worrisome matter for the bank and the bank has to do certain things for this. So, there are uh, uh, these are sensitive to there are some positive things with respect to use of the risk weighted asset because they are uh, sensitive to the uh, uh, some extent to difference in bank risk taking incorporate off balance sheet activities in the risk assessments do not penalize banks for holding low risk liquid assets increase the consistency of rules applied to large banks around the world but there are some problems because it deals with only the credit risk and the concept uses book value rather than the market value of the assets. Other type of risks are ignored for calculating this and portfolio diversification concept is also ignored here. Then uh, they have after that uh, considering the importance of the other, other risk, they have added the market risk into the consideration and the source of market risk is basically fluctuations of the interest rate and currency risk and the price of the equity. So, uh, in this context they have developed a model which is basically the value at risk model to calculate that. So, now they have added a another kind of component of the capital that is tier 3 which only for the uh, adjusting the market risk where we have the long term subordinated debt is considered as the part of the uh, tier 3 capital and options not to pay if minimum record amount capital is 8 percent that is the rule basically they have provided. And according to this, the value at risk me uh, methods already we have discussed in the previous session. But one example is suppose a bank estimates its portfolio daily average value is 100 million dollar over a 10 day interval with a 99 percent level of confidence. And if this bar estimates of 100 million dollar is correct, then losses in the portfolio value greater than 100 dollar million should occur less than 1 percent of the time. More pre precisely, the bank's management anticipates a lossing of 100 million for 99 out of 100 10 day intervals. So, uh, this is an analysis of the bank's historical distribution of losses of the trading portfolio. That is why the management should always want to compare the estimated future value future loss to the current level of equity capital to make sure that the institution is sufficiently capitalized in order to avoid the failure. If management determines that it bar estimates are rising the bank must consider either increasing the amount of regulatory uh, defined capital it holds in order to observe the rising level of risk to take the steps to reduce the risk exposure. So, what basically we have discussed here the minimum capital requirement has increased from 8 percent to total capital to the risk averted assets. Banks minimum capital requirement is linked to its credit risk. Capitals are broadly divided into tier 1 and tier 2. Proper risk weights are given to calculate the risk weighted assets, particularly the uh, risk weighted uh, assets are calculated on the basis of the credit risk. 
and market risk has been added to calculate the risk weighted assets further in 1996. So, these are the references what you can go through. Thank you.